Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, so far this storm season, we have witnessed a bull market in tropical depressions and hurricanes, which can be a bad thing, of course, but maybe a good thing in at least one way. Welcome again to the most widely watched source of Carolina business policy and public affairs. I am Chris William, and thank you for supporting this dialogue these last 29 years. What would, why would storms be a good thing? Because it could be distracting from the drumbeat of acrimonious news around things like the possibility of a recession, redistricting, international trade issues, workforce skills gap, rural urban divide, opioids, et cetera, et cetera. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, we won't discuss everything, but we will talk about those issues that matter most right here in our two-state region. Later on, we're joined by the Chief Executive Officer of MUSC in Charleston, Dr. Patrick Cauley. Stay with us. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Bearings, a leading global asset management firm dedicated to meeting the evolving investment and capital needs of its clients. Learn more at Bearings.com. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, Janet Labar from the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance, Bob Quinn of SCRA, and special guest, Dr. Patrick Cauley, CEO of MUSC Health. Welcome again to our program. Happy weekend, Bob. Nice to have you here. Janet, welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Janet, you uh, so interesting, just very quickly. So you came from the Pacific Northwest mm -hmm. where you worked on a region around Portland. Right. And the idea was to bring together not just economic development, but chamber styles and, mm -hmm. and all types of demographics to be a voice of one. You come to uh, the center of the Carolinas, the Charlotte region, which right. has now has a regional business alliance. Right. What has, the, what has that been like, getting everyone on the same page about being regional? That's the first question. Okay. Second question is, what is regionalism? Mm -hmm. Wonderful question, Chris, and thank you for having me here. Um, I think regional, uh, for us, coming into the market and creating a new organization, again, you mentioned kind of the, the coming together, uh, we are one business voice. Um, the region is strong and there's a tremendous upside uh, for people across the 15 county region, a bi-state region that spans into South Carolina, crosses over to North Carolina, and there's a, there's a healthy appetite uh, for people who want to see more economic growth and economic growth for all. Uh, really, there's a, a strong notion of prosperity for all that's built into um, a desire to see business growth um, really continue to propel itself for the Charlotte region. Healthy appetite across folks who I've been meeting with, economic development practitioners, business leaders, who really believe that um, together, you know, we can really make the Charlotte region um, a healthy, vibrant, innovative um, economy mm -hmm. and one that stands out really for the United States. And then I think when it comes to what is uh, regionalism, it is in the same connotation of operating with one voice. It's positioning the Charlotte region as a place to do business no matter where you are. And why I have enjoyed working um, in a regional economic development model for the last 17 years, I find it, um, you know, a little easier to be able to sell something that um, is going to, to fit companies of all types of spaces, industries, um, different sub technology sectors, uh, whether they need 50,000 square feet or they need 50 acres. Mm -hmm. um, having a regional option and many for them is, is something that I, I find a lot of uh, enjoyment in. 
Bob, you hail from a, a, a similar urban city that's grown up into now almost a super region, and of course Charleston in the Low Country. Yeah. Does any of this ring true, true for you? Oh yeah, w without a doubt. And as a statewide organization, we mm. actually view regionalism encompassing both states. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of notable examples where the states are working together. Uh, one is uh, an organization called E4 Carolinas, mm. based out of the, the Charlotte area. Uh, and their mission is to retain and attract world-class energy-related companies mm -hmm. into both states. Mm -hmm. So they have membership across both states. And as a matter of fact, we uh, just hosted one of their meetings at our facility in, in Somerville. Technology flows back and mm -hmm. forth across borders as okay. well. Another local Charlotte company, uh, Rhino, used to be Rhino Assembly, now mm. Rhino Toolhouse, mm. uh, recently hosted at the Charlotte Speedway what they call the Innovation Hub, where they brought in mm. companies that are looking for technologies as well as the suppliers of technologies. And some of our SE launch companies, these are early stage technology-based companies, participated in that event, and there are now a number of collaborations coming out of that. The, and, and not to cut you off, but yeah. the, the idea that you, it, it, that's, the skepticism and cynicism in some cases mm. about people that are not willing to be part of what a regional effort is because they have to give up some control, maybe some revenue. Are you seeing some of those barriers fall? Yeah, without a doubt. Yeah. Um, and I mean more broadly than just the tech folks that, yeah. that are drinking the same cool. Mm -hmm. Sure. Well, mm -hmm. you think about supply chain and logistics, that knows no borders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have lots of examples mm -hmm. of suppliers from the, the North Carolina bringing in their product to our OEMs in South Carolina and, and vice versa. Same thing with logistics. Both are, are uh, taking advantage of the Port of Charleston mm -hmm. as well as, as Charlotte D Douglas. Um, mm -hmm. Commerce has no no boundaries, or, nor should it. And I, I would just echo that, uh, Chris, because I, I think you know, companies so broader outside of you know the technology sector, um, companies are looking at Charlotte, and they might say, we want to have some sort of. Um, facility or operations in Charlotte and and really you know what they're looking for um, they can cite in Catawba or they can cite in Chesterfield South Carolina I think um, you know metro economies are regional and the work shed uh, the labor pool people don't all have you know the privilege of living working playing in the same county mm -hmm. or in the same municipality and so I think companies understand that there there are no borders and I think government understands that more and more okay. Uh, and this is a one-off, but back in the summer, uh, beginning of the summer this year, David Tepper, owner of the Charlotte mm. uh, Panthers, Carolina, Carolina Panthers, I can't believe I just said that. <laughs> yes, I've only been here since the crust of the earth cooled. Uh, they never were called the Charlotte Panthers, yeah. but anyway, the Carolina Panthers owner, yeah. David Tepper, yeah. has obviously moved the headquarters or made the, but moving the headquarters down to Rock Hill. Now that's in the Charlotte region, but sure. will, will, do you expect you're going to see more of that cross-border, not just... Yeah. Uh, an iconic brand going south, but an iconic brand maybe coming north. Sure, sure. And in fact, recently we we invited uh, both Governor McMaster and Governor Cooper to have a, a fireside chat with us to talk about you know seeing joint collaboration around the Charlotte region and what what type of shared investment opportunities can can both states uh, do and meek, uh, make make and meet um, in the Charlotte market. And, and in fact, we use the Carolina pa Panthers as an example for the type of catalytic, catalytic opportunities uh, that can really be cross-border. But I, I see a lot of that in the technology space, actually, and in innovation. If there was an innovation corridor um, that stretched uh, both both sides of the border, that w what, what is the potential? Mm -hmm. What could we really do that, that would have state government backing, that would involve industry, um, that could really propel the Charlotte region to be world-class? and a center of excellence um, in a space to be defined. Uh, but yeah, I absolutely see, see um, I think, that, that movement and that expansion of investment um, occurring on both sides. Um, Bob, just quickly, I wanna, I wanna ask you about, a, you know, obviously you know tech, tech transfer, tech space, academics. Uh, South Carolina Research Authority has got that down. When you look across the state of South Carolina, you see how well, not just the Department of Commerce has done, but the state itself has grown this idea of, of aerospace and automotive, does that, th that very deep focus into that heavy equipment manufacturing and that more narrow portfolio of, of industries in South Carolina concern you when it comes to next recession or maybe just a diverse portfolio? 
Uh, no, because it, that is not the, the end all. Uh, we certainly have a primary focus there. Uh, and they, those have shown themselves to be resilient uh, industries. Mm -hmm. But we also have a vibrant biotech uh, mm -hmm. industry. I know you had Sam Condoris, the SE Bio, on, on recently. It's an $11.5 billion industry and, and growing uh, substantially, putting a lot of focus into growing tech. And recently, I know you had Susie Shannon from the Council on Competitiveness recently, working with them to, to stand up an organization called Tech SC. Uh, so we believe in clusters, uh, we believe in a diversified economy, and we're putting our bets uh, across mm -hmm. industries, not just on yeah. those two. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you mentioned all those people, you know, the whole idea is to have a regional dialogue. So there's, right. there's some uh, method to that madness. We're going to meet our guests in just a moment. Coming up on our program, Fred Whitfield is the president and the vice chairman of the Charlotte Hornets. Why that's important. Uh, certainly, Michael Jordan is the iconic brand on the Charlotte Hornets and was one of the players of, or one of the players of the game. But Fred Whitfield uh, may have been their secret weapon for a long time now. He will join us on this program. John McConnell from McConnell Golf also coming up on our program uh, in in the near future. For a long time now, the Medical University of South Carolina has held this special place in healthcare in South Carolina's Low Country. But recently, through st strategic moves and more specifically, the acquisition of four previously run hospitals in Marion, Florence, Chester, and Lancaster, MUSC has demonstrably extended regional influence into a larger portion of the state. Joining us now, Chief Executive Officer of Charleston's MUSC Health, Dr. Patrick Cauley. Dr. Cauley, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me, Chris. So if you were in Charleston, it was an easy one. If you ever, ever needed a procedure or you needed an expert, and we're probably going to hear from Roper here for saying this, but <laughs> MUSC was the place. And clearly you're trying to extend that reach, and that seems intentional. Is, am I right to assume that? Yes, it's, it's absolutely very intentional. You know, healthcare is in the middle of a transformation. Probably it may be one of the greatest transformations we're in the middle of that none of us see it, mm. but we're standing in it. And it's going on over a period of a few decades. And what's happening is there, there's really a push and a demand for higher quality, more reliability, a concept well known to business, but healthcare has not been known as a place for high reliability. And then the third thing is lower cost. Those three things are being demanded and expected. And there's tremendous pressures on healthcare right now, and it's on MUSC. We see, we see it, mm -hmm. we feel it. And you know, we decided about five, six years ago, it was not possible just to sit in Charleston and be able to weather all these storms coming. So we, you know, got our board together and decided that we needed to be a little more proactive. So, well, hospitals is this. The other maybe unspoken part of this is, is consolidation. Hospitals have to consolidate or die, and that may be a little too extreme, but you get the point. Well, if you look across other industries, uh, there's consolidation has occurred significantly. That has not happened in healthcare. I mean, there's been a lot of high profile consolidations, but on a percentage basis, it still remains pretty small. Mm -hmm. I do think you're gonna see increasing consolidation. Where will it stop? Who knows, but it, it is definitely gonna Going to, going to occur, and we're not immune to it. There's no hospital in this nation uh, that's immune to it. Yeah, okay, Janet, question? You know, I think about patient-centered care and, and it, coming about, it coming to be about the outcomes of, of how um, you know, patients are cared for, and so tell me more a little bit about the innovation capacity that um, MUHC is, is going, did I get the acronym right? It's all right. Okay, I there's a lot the of alphabet Hornets soup thing. in here, there we go. Um, more of that innovation capacity so that it focuses more on the patient and what those outcomes look like. Sure, well, we're an academic health system, so we're all about innovation. Mm -hmm. What can we do differently? What can we right. do new? Um, and it's also important to look at how we measure quality. You know, a lot of people feel that quality is measured Mm -hmm. with just patient-centeredness. But mm -hmm. to us, we measure quality across six things. Uh, safe, effective, mm -hmm. efficient, equitable, patient-centered, and timely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those six domains, we try to innovate amongst all of those. Nice. One of the things we've also done in the last five years as we've, as we've grown the health system, we've also grown our innovation capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, we've invested in a chief innovation officer, a chief innovation mm -hmm. uh, office in order to get there's just a lot of great ideas that our team just yeah. loves to put out there, and we're trying to nurture them mm -hmm. uh, more. So mm -hmm. I, I would say 
innovation for us when it comes to healthcare is in anything. Nice. We'll we'll do patient centeredness, but at the same time, we'll try mm -hmm. to develop something that maybe maybe is more timely, um, awesome. or maybe it's a new piece of equipment, mm -hmm. or maybe mm -hmm. it's a new process. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're we're trying to develop that because we firmly believe that if we're not on the front of this mm -hmm. transformation, mm -hmm. we're going to get swallowed up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dr. Cawley, states like North and South Carolina have rather substantial health disparities issue um, driven by factors like socioeconomic, mm -hmm. geographic. Mm -hmm. Back to the subject of innovation, how can one use innovation to address that issue? I, that's a great question, Bob, and I think that, you know, health disparities are going to become almost a new epidemic in the next mm. uh, five to 10 years as, as people begin to understand them more and understand the degree to which they are a disparity. So we, we, f we believe in, in tackling that head on. Probably the, I mean, there's many, many ways, but probably the way I would say uh, that maybe the greatest equalizer of all is telehealth. Mm -hmm. So we, about five, six years ago, through a grant that started from the uh, South Carolina legislature, now we're given some dollars to innovate around telehealth and they've consistently mm -hmm. uh, put dollars forward every year. We're trying all kinds of things to bring telehealth into rural communities, into areas where, you know, uh, you can't get to the doctor. Um, you know, these days, everybody's got a smartphone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in the low 90s in terms of uh, the percent of people with uh, smartphones. So we think that's a great way to get to people in a way that they haven't been touched in the past, almost leaping over mm -hmm. to uh, solve some of those disparities. And I think you're being a little modest. I, I believe MUSC is really at the forefront of, of telehealth uh, mm -hmm. across the country. Is, is that the great differentiator though, Dr. Cauley? And mm -hmm. I say not, not because you're right, Bob, MUSC was on cutting edge of that. You've got green, well, what used to be called Greenville Health System, obviously. Now Prisma says the same thing. You've got Atrium, you've got Novant, mm -hmm. you've got... The, is, is that the great differentiator for you or because you were first mover in that area, did it give you some leverage? No, we, we think our differentiator is a little bit different. We, we, we think ours is not about size. We think our differentiator is tied to our academic presence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You know, we, t we, we often talk about, we stand at the crossroads of healthcare, where healthcare is taught, where healthcare is innovated, uh, and where it's actually practiced. So we think that's our differentiator. So we. We, we tout all the time our academic side and our education components and um, and what research we're mm -hmm. doing and, and what innovations we're trying. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's that's for us what it what it's about. Th these acquisitions, you know, a lot of a lot of people think it was all about just building a bigger system, consolidation. But for us, it was just as important to the academic side. Every almost every college, every university in this United States is moving more and more into health systems mm -hmm. and, and healthcare mm -hmm. programs. Um, that's a lot of competition for uh, for training slots, and and we've experienced mm -hmm. that in the last ten years. Just about every university has. Mm -hmm. So, one of the other reasons to bring on these four hospitals was to have additional training uh, mm -hmm. places. This almost doubles our capacity. And the number of hospital beds. Mm -hmm. So, so, so this this plays into it as well. I mean, not to not to say competition isn't good and healthy, but isn't there a healthcare um, shortage across the country? I mean, when I think about the aging workforce and, and the demand for for um, specific um, skills in the healthcare industry, it, isn't it that more of this is better? Well, M more I, teaching universities. I, I, I would hospitals. say absolutely yeah. that there's a there's a huge demand for healthcare out mm -hmm. there, and it's it's heavily driven by the baby boomers as they age, mm -hmm. and there's more chronic illness. Uh, more and more people are living into their 90s. I yeah. mean, every one of us, you know, that was so rare decades ago. Now all of us know dozens of people uh, well into their 90s. Right. So that does mean more health care. Mm -hmm. um, you, you, you are touching on one of my worries is mm -hmm. workforce. Mm -hmm. And, and workforce, you're talking more nurses, more surgical techs, right. more nursing techs. Um, an area that, that we're, we're trying to solve mm -hmm. uh, regionally and statewide mm -hmm. uh, as well. But that may be the thing that slows it down. Yeah. Even in Charleston, yeah. you have trouble convincing people to move to the holy <laughs> city? <laughs> well, e even in Charleston. Yeah. Charleston okay. is not as uh, inexpensive as it used yeah, to be. Okay. So it's, uh, but, but for us, it may be even a little bit different. You know, Roper across the street from us may have certain kind of workforce problems. Our workforce problems tend to be you know, subspecialty nurses, you know, mm. pediatric nurses, you know, we're the only pediatric program 
in the state, and 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 we need those mm -hmm. those kind of nurses. Yeah. So, Bob. So as you well know, the trend is towards capitation payments versus fee for service. Mm -hmm. How has that affected, if it has, the adoption of new medical innovation, whether that be therapeutics or mm -hmm. medical devices? Mm -hmm. You know. A lot of people feel that capitation has is, is got their good side and bad side. Uh, you're going to see me uh, think capitation is a good thing. It's a good thing for, I'm a healthcare provider, and not many healthcare mm -hmm. providers would say that. I got exposed to capitation early in my career done right. Capitation done right, I think, is all about appropriate care and about uh, innovation mm -hmm. and about trying things that maybe maybe it's a little different than the, than the usual. So. So I think, once again, done right. I'll always qualify that with done right. Um, I think it spurs further innovation. I don't think it'll stop, um, stop anything. Mm -hmm. As MUSC CEO, you certainly look at things a particular way, but you're a doc, you're an MD. Yes. And when you hear vaping and the issues mm -hmm. that goes on, go on around vaping, would you describe it as the traditional medical epidemic? What goes through your mind with that? Well, you know, I've, over my career, I've seen the opioid crisis come. And, and the opioid crisis was, was like this slow wave. You, can, you could see pieces and parts coming and, and, and it was additive and it got bigger and bigger. Vaping feels the same way because mm. it's got a lot of different elements to it. Um, you know, first, we, we don't even fully understand vaping. We don't understand the effects on the body. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is it, it would appear that much of the severe illness related to vaping is related to things that are being added into it. And there's all these additives available mm. today uh, that, weren't, that weren't available even 20 years ago. So, and, and we don't know what any of those uh, are doing. The third thing is that I, I have children that are teenagers and um, you know, the problem with the vaping is it can be done so quietly and it doesn't mm. smell, uh, if you choose not to have it smell. Yeah. Um, and, and it, could, it could take on uh, even before you know it. So, so all those things worry me. I could feel it coming in much the way the opioid crisis came and is affecting us. And uh, I'm, I'm deeply worried about it uh, as a physician. Mm -hmm. Janet, we got about three minutes. Yeah, well, I just, I wanna come back to workforce for a little bit. And, um, you know, healthcare as a sector is, um, the largest one in the Charlotte region. Um, certainly, you know, Chris mentioned Novon and Atrium, North Carolina, um, Caramont even, mm -hmm. uh, across the Charlotte region. So, you know, is there anything that the economic development community across the Carolinas can do to support um, that continued growth and that continued innovation? Um, is there anything that we can do to help that? I know recruiting hospitals isn't probably something that we're going to get in the business of doing, but if, are there supply chains, are there specific things that, that we can start targeting that would be helpful to you and your system and systems across the region? Well, you gotta add MUSC to the Charlotte region now too, yeah. since we're in Lancaster County. Yeah, um, that's right. I, I think get more knowledge out about these jobs. Mm -hmm. There are great mm -hmm. jobs in healthcare, which okay. people don't know about. I mean, right. even even things like an opening job is learning how to take blood, mm -hmm. right? And but so that the job, attraction piece a little bit. Yeah, but back that to but that course. job yeah. can lead to that can, can lead to a nursing assistant, can lead to a nurse. I mean, right. all these jobs, but people don't know about them. They yeah. they don't know the healthcare system. Um, I mean, there are jobs like surgical techs mm -hmm. or and, and and actually supply chain is is a big issue mm -hmm. for uh, for all healthcare entities. Just mm -hmm. about every healthcare entity now has big, large. Uh, several hundred thousand square foot right. uh, uh, warehouses. We're right. just opening ours up. Um, and, and so supply chain is mm -hmm. just as important. Mm -hmm. And sterile processing. We, we gotta get more information out about, about these jobs. Cause they're, they're, right. they're good jobs, right. uh, they're stable. They're not, gonna be, they're not gonna be subject to the whims of mm -hmm. the economy at times. Mm -hmm. um, they're needed. Is, is, and we've literally got about a minute and a half left. Is approval rating a problem for hospitals? When people look at things like, well, I don't completely trust banks or uh, Congress or hospitals because they're suspect of costs that are opaque and they're not sure of things. Is that, is that an issue for you all? Healthcare transparent or price transparency is, is, uh, is, is something we have to tackle. Yeah. Um, I sit on the American Hospital Association Price Transparency Task Force. I, I firmly believe in it. We got to get there. Um, and, and, and there's, there's many pieces and parts to that. It's hard, it's 
it's it's it's you're talking decades yeah. of issues there. But but we got to tackle it because it's actually it is affecting uh, the hospital's brand. Yeah. Um, so and, and we got to get to a day which people know when I walk into that office or I walk into that hospital, I'm going to pay this. Yes. And that, not a dime more. Th thank you. Hate to interrupt you. That'll be the last word. Thank you for making the trip. It's good Absolutely. to see you, Dr. Collins. Appreciate you coming. You bet. Bob, nice to see you again. Thank you, Chris. Janet, welcome to the Carolinas Thanks, from Chris. the Pacific Northwest. A lot better place to be. <laughs> thank you. Glad you're here. <laughs> thank you. Until next week, I'm Chris Woody, and we hope your business and your weekend are good. Good night. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by Martin Marietta. Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Bearings, Grant Thornton, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.